two ways <laughs> to wake up. <laughs> Hare Krishna. So, officially, this evening at 6.15, everyone try to be here at the, in the temple because we're going to do the official beginning of the uh, festival weekend with an RT to the holy name of the Lord and that'll begin at 6.15 we'll do puja and then we'll do Gora RT and then Janaki Nath Prabhu will give class at uh, 7 o'clock till 8.30 today we're just touching just some of the general points uh, Sri Harinam Chintamani by Srila Haridas Thakur is one of the most important and most direct and complete uh, treatises on teaching the science of chanting Hare Krishna. It's the most complete. And Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur puts it together based on Srila Haridas Thakur's uh, writings, or actually, yeah, his writings. So this is quite deep, and the basic principle is he takes one chapter after another and speaks on one of the offenses to the Holy Name. And so today, what I'll do is do a summary of the, the ten offenses on the Holy Name, based on Harinam Chintamani, and along with another work by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur called Jaiva Dharma, which is probably one of the most complete philosophical and both practical ways to understand the science of Bhakti. Bhakti is a science. It's a very deep science. And so it must be, and when you have science, you have the experiment, and then you have the ingredients. The ingredients that make up the science are the process, but the laboratory conditions that make the ingredients bring about the desired results is the mood. <laughs> the mood. How we execute the ingredients that make up bhakti. <laughs> what is our mood? If our mood is about us, then the laboratory is not conducive to the ingredients. If, the, if it's about glorifying Krishna and serving Krishna and following the instructions given by Srila Prabhupada and the Acharyas, then the laboratory experiment will be in a favorable condition. And that favorable condition will bring about the full mercy of the Lord. <laughs> What's favorable brings the mercy of the Lord. What's unfavorable brings something else. Not necessarily Krishna's mercy in the way that we expect it. So here, this is one verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam. It's one of the most important verses in uh, Glorifying the holy name of the Lord, as spoken by Srila Sukadeva Goswami. And it's uh, quite often chanted by uh, the great souls. Now, the purport is too long, it's about four pages, three, three full pages. So, I'll, what I'll do it is a section of the purport which lists the holy name the the ten offenses to the holy name so we'll go through the verse om namo bhagavate vasudevaya om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 
etam nidvidyamananam Ichchitam makutvayam Yoginam nirpanirnitam Harer namanu kirtanam Etam nirvidyamananam Ichchitam makutvayam Yoginam nirpanirnitam Harer namanu kirtanam Etam nirvidyamananam Ichchitam makutvayam Yoginam nirpanirnitam Hare Nama Nukirtanam Those who are completely freed from all material desires. It's <clears throat> chitam of those who are desirous of all sorts of material enjoyment. Hakutabayam, free from all doubts and fear. Yoginam. Of all who are self-satisfied, <coughs> nirpa, O King, nirnitam, decided truth, hare, of the Lord, Shri Krishna, nama, holy name, anu, after someone, always, kirtanam. Chanting. Translation. O King, constantly chanting of the holy name of the Lord after the ways of the great authorities is the doubtless and fearless way for success for all, including those who are free from all material desires, those who are desirous of all material enjoyment, and also those who are self-satisfied by dint of transcendental knowledge. Srila Prabhupada's purport. I'm going to take parts of the purport because it's a little bit long. In the previous verse, the great necessity for attaining attachment to Mukunda has been accredited. There are different types of persons who desire to attain success in different varieties of pursuits. 
Generally, the persons are materialists who desire to enjoy to the fullest extent of material gratification. Next to them are the transcendentalists who have attained perfect knowledge about the nature of material enjoyment and thus are aloof from such an illusory way of life. More or less they are satisfied in themselves by self-realization. Above them are the devotees of the Lord who neither aspire for material enjoyment I'm sorry, neither aspire to enjoy the material world nor to get out of it. They are after the satisfaction of the Lord Sri Krishna. In other words, the devotees of the Lord do not want anything on their personal account. If the Lord desires, the devotee can accept all sorts of material facilities. If the Lord does not desire this, the devotee can leave aside all sorts of facilities, even up to the living of salvation. Nor are they self-satisfied because they want the satisfaction of the Lord only. In this verse, Srila Sukadeva Goswami recommends the transcendental chanting of the holy name of the Lord. By offenseless chanting and hearing of the holy name of the Lord, one becomes acquainted with the transcendental form of the Lord, and then with the attributes of the Lord, and then with the transcendental nature of his pastimes, etc., it is here mentioned that one should constantly chant the holy name of the Lord after hearing it from the great authorities. This means that hearing from the authorities is the first essential principle. Hearing of the holy name gradually promotes one to the stage of hearing about his form, his attributes, his pastimes, and so on, and thus the necessity of chanting of his glories develops successfully. This process is recommended not only for the successful execution of devotional service, but also for even those who are materially attached. According to Sri Sukadeva Goswami, this way of attaining success is established fact, concluded only by him, concluded not only by him, but also by the previous acharyas. Therefore, there is no need for further evidence. The process is recommended not only for the progressive student in different departments of ideological success, but also for those who are already successful in their achievement as fruit of workers, as the philosophies, philosophers or the devotees of the Lord. And then he goes on to, Prabhupada goes on to mention that Srila Jiva Goswami instructs us to chant the holy name of the Lord loudly, and it should be performed offensively as well. One can deliver himself from the effects of all sins by surrendering himself unto the Lord. And then he goes on to mention these. Well, one more point. Okay, one can deliver himself from all offenses at the feet of the Lord by taking shelter of his holy name. But one cannot protect himself if one commits an offense at the feet of the holy name of the Lord. Such offenses are mentioned in the Padma Purana as being ten in number. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gena Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namachaha Shri Chaitanya Manobi Stam Stapti Tam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swapadantikam Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Srivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So it says both in this verse and in Jaiva Dharma and also in Harinam Chintanami. If one is infected with Nama Parad, that means one is chanting with offense. There's only one way that one can be delivered from these offenses, and that says only by incessant chanting can one be delivered. In other words, one has to continue to chant, 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 and very carefully avoid offenses. Um, in the Shastras, it mentions that there are two principles of consideration by the devotees. One is called vidis, 
and the other one is called nishedas. Vidis means things that one must execute that are favorable for the execution of devotional service. Sanatana Goswami calls it anukulena. And then the other aspect is one should carefully avoid those things which cause one to block one's progress in devotional service. And that are called nishedas. Or as uh, Sanatana Goswami says, pratikul, patikulena. So one should emphasize the favorable and carefully avoid the unfavorable. The tendency of the devotees, at least in our movement, from what I can observe, is that devotees are pretty much aware of what to do, but they're not aware of what not to do. (laughs) And we make these mistakes a lot. We make these mistakes a lot. If we don't avoid what not to do, we will get very little benefit or any from doing what we should do. It nullifies and practically waters down the success of proper execution of devotional service. So this, it's a science, and therefore the ingredients must be carefully placed within the proper mood. If the mood is proper, one can carefully avoid offenses. If one doesn't have the right mood, then it's easy to commit offenses. And along with the mood, one should be aware of what are the offenses. The offenses are listed as ten in number. And of course, today, like every day in our Krishna consciousness execution, we recite the ten offenses in the morning program. Why? Because Prabhupada instituted that in the very beginning of our Krishna consciousness in order to help us remember that this should be a consideration that we should always know of. Jai Sri Panchitattva Ki Jai. And so, these ten offenses are the word, we mentioned this last night for those of you who weren't here, that the word aparad is the Sanskrit word for offense. Apa means against, and Radha represents Radharani, who is the personification of pure bhakti. So aparada means against Radharani, (laughs) or against the principles of pure devotional service. So bhakti, or chanting, it goes through three stages. One is namaparada, and then gradually we move away from that into uh, namabhas. And then from namabhas we come to sudanam, or pure chanting. To get to namabhas, one has to be aware of the fences and try to avoid them. If one is still committing offenses, but is trying to avoid, they can still reach the stage of namabhas. As long as they're not committing certain offenses, like the first offense to the holy name, the seventh offense to the holy name, and the third offense. These three are the most dangerous of all the offenses, especially the first offense. And we'll describe what is the first offense. So I thought it would be nice that devotees can list the different offenses, and then we'll explain as we list them. So, mm -hmm. okay. Who put this thing together here? It's, It's all backwards. I think it's backwards. Let me see if I can find it. Where's the first offense? Okay. I think we got it. So what is the first offense? Some devotee, yeah? The 
the pure bhaktas, as was says, who have exclusively surrendered to Harinam, have given up all material aspiration, such as karma yoga, jnana yoga, principles of dharma, tapasya, and astanga yoga. Therefore, to enviously criticize those persons are very harmful. Harinam cannot tolerate any blasphemy against them because they are engaged in propagating the transcendental teachings and factual glories of the Holy Name. Therefore, one must carefully desist from being critical of sadhus who are guardians of the Holy Name and recognize their elevated status. One should join them in Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement of Harinam Sankirtan and therefore instantly attract the mercy of Harinam. So, to vilify, to criticize, to blaspheme, that's the strongest, those devotees who have dedicated to life to preaching the glories of the Holy Name is called the mad elephant offense. <laughs> Now, if you have a garden, and you made nice flowers, so many beautiful tulips. We were looking at tulips yesterday. So beautiful. And uh, roses. Roses come in different colors. And uh, very fragrant. They say the best of all flowers is the rose, right? There's even a poem. A rose is a rose is a rose is a rose, right? Very anamatapia, very literary embellishments. So there's you make a nice garden with so many nice flowers and shrubs and trees and bushes and you 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 design it in such a nice way. That's your bhakti. <laughs> but then you say, all right, here's a nice elephant. I'm gonna invite him in to see my garden. What happens? What's he gonna do to your garden? Finished. <laughs> He's, gonna, he's just going to stomp on everything and destroy it. So, and especially if the elephant is mad, when they get into musk, then everybody runs. The villagers all run. The villages gets deserted when the elephant becomes mad. Because no one can stop a mad elephant. So, two, this analogous of criticizing, finding fault with those who have dedicated their lives to chanting, or not only chanting, but propagating the teachings of Sri Harina. Okay, so that's the first offense. Any questions about that? That's pretty much self-explanatory. Actually, one should avoid criticizing any devotee. And one should avoid criticizing every anybody. One may... One may find some discretion in a person's behavior or character, but one should not broadcast that and make it your, what we say, your conversational piece. We like to talk gossip, and gossip is, is another form of offense because talking about others in a negative way is also offensive, and especially talking about great souls. Mm, that is oh, not only offensive, but Harinam will no longer provide mercy in blocks. So we have to be very careful. That's the first offense. So I'll go through all the ten offenses. And then maybe as we go through, if there's any questions, you can put your hands up and then we'll... Yes. Just speak, I can hear you. I was thinking about um, being, um, um, making, how to say, um, just, um, how in English. If you think about something that's uh, negative, mm -hmm. it's not offensive. But if you speak it or act on it, it is. But the problem of keeping negative thoughts within the mind is that they could manifest it externally. They can manifest externally, and then that becomes offensive. Um, that you have, like, we need to have some judgment, but the judgment, which is based Let on... Let people who are in a position to do that as a service judge, 
Don't you judge. <laughs> if you find that a person's character or behavior is unpalatable, you can avoid that association. Like that you have someone, some person who is your friend and is judgmental, and how to like or correct or going away, like like. Well, there's different ways to express your friendship. When if it's a friend, that means you're pretty much able to converse with each other with no problems. You say, "My dear friend, what you're saying is not good for you, and I don't want to hear it either." <laughs> Because everyone knows criticism is bad, but what is the nature of criticism? It's a disturbed mind, or a mind that's not filled with Krishna consciousness, or a mind that's filled with unfulfilled material desires. So when, these, when the mind is in that state, then even something that is not worthy of even noticing, we notice it and find fault with it. <laughs> like that. So one can communicate in a very sensitive, in a very, what we say, precise way, being very sensitive to the person, because you can't offend the offender. That's another form of offense. If a person is offensive, and you're trying to stop them, and you're offending them, then what is, you, all you're doing is just exasperating the problem. And so. So one has to be able to do it in such a way that you can communicate nicely. But in, the, in many cases we ask authorities to do that if it's in the temple environment. Okay, does that help? Yes, Sri Devi. Uh, sinful or wrong, then what should be our uh, action? Should we criticize them or mm. correct them? We're in contact with this non devotee, is that it? She says no, she's not in contact. No, 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 they don't, don't, because the non devotees are always doing everything wrong. <laughs> 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 They're killing each other wholesale every day. <laughs> So the non-devotees, because they're under the influence of the illusionary energy, they're bound to act in a wrong way. Now, sometimes they come to the principle of goodness and they act morally, politely, respectfully, and carry on what they call normal etiquette. And then we consider that, oh, that's, that's acceptable. But, and we can resonate with that in such, such a way that we don't find fault. But usually that's another fault anyway because they're always covered with the desire to present themselves in different ways in order to fulfill their material desires, generally. You call them modern moralists. <laughs> it's good business to be nice. <laughs> so generally we don't well, Prabhupada, in making his point in the Shastras, in order to for us to understand, he points out the faults of the non-devotees to show what we should be avoiding. Using the examples of that. But, then, but Prabhupada is non-envious, and he has complete compassion for all living entities. So he's not speaking in a mean spirit. He's speaking for, for the sake of instructions, that's all. He doesn't hate the other person, nor does he take, what we say, any kind of enmity towards him. But we can't always do that. So the non-devotees, you can expect them to act like that. That's just the way they are. better not to associate with them. That's why we don't associate with non-devotees, but if we have to be in their association, we should just be very respectful. That's all. Give respects to others. That's all.
People will disturb you, but if you should never become disturbed. You should expect this may happen in that association. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we ride on planes and we see people's behavior on the planes are really quite abominable sometimes, especially nowadays more and more. Did any of you have that experience on your way over here? <laughs> Bavesh, yeah. Yeah, it's just the way it is. People don't no longer follow even etiquette. They just so we just you know we just turn our face away from that. What can you do? Tolerate it. Anything else? Yes, Tushar. Yeah, I got the question. Uh, is there anything, any distinction between thinking and then speaking? Big one. <laughs> You're not, this age is Kali Yuga, and the Shastras say, we're not accountable for wrong thoughts. We get credit for good thoughts, and we don't get punished for wrong thoughts. This is the special concessions mentioned in the first canto. 18th chapter of Bhagavatam. I think it's 118.7, if I can remember correctly. In that, Prabhupada says, because of the age of Kali being so bad, bad thoughts come from everywhere, outside and inside. So one should not somehow or other uh, dwell on them, push them out. But you don't get punished for that. But if you allow them to stay and, they, and you speak them, then you get a reaction. Or if you do something in relationship to that, you get a reaction. So that's when I was first, when I joined the movement, my, my bhakta leader used to tell me, kill that thought or it'll kill you. That's what he would tell me all the time. But he would scream it at me. <laughs> thought or I'll kill you okay 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 I got it <laughs> that was Bhakta Bhakta Ashram in the old days <laughs> it was like drill sergeants <laughs> so you know sorry about that but he's my good friend now he's still around <laughs> but he used to do that to everybody not just me <laughs> But he wanted to make a point, and he made his point. <laughs> <There was no laughs> I mean, when you heard that, you, you were afraid to think anything wrong. <laughs> so, yeah, and, that, and I, that stuck with me for years. I always, always remember that. that. Don't allow bad thoughts to enter your mind, negative thoughts. Try to push them out when they come. And when you see them there... Just replace them with Krishna conscious thoughts or something pleasant, something that counteracts the negativity. And that you're actually cultivating or culturing the mind in the proper way. If you don't do that and you try to approach the holy name, you can't chant. There's no way. You can't expect that when we sit down and chant, the mind's going to be different than what we did the other 22 hours. <laughs> So the 22 hours of the rest of the day is a cultivation of the proper consciousness of devotion which facilitates the quality of our chanting. It's not separate. Second offense. Someone else? Okay, say again. Worshipping the demigods independently of Krishna. Okay, so now there's two. One, one should not worship the demigods such as Lord Brahma or Lord Shiva as independent or equal to Lord 
Vishnu. So here there's two points in that. Intellectual hair splitting of the relative significance of the name and qualities of Shiva, the foremost of the devas, and Vishnu, the Supreme Lord, and considering these personalities to be independent of each other or thinking they are competing with each other as the Supreme Ishwar is offense. Such an intellectual posture is tantamount to polytheism and therefore a great hindrance in the growth of unalloyed Hari Bhakti. Thus one must chant Hari Nam with the realization that Sri Krishna is the Supreme Ishwar and all the devas, including Shiva and Brahma, who receive their powers from him, are thus certainly not independent of his control. So I don't think we have too much problems with that in Western countries. It's those people who have been cultivated in the Vedic culture, maybe from the land of India, who have that culture and tradition, sometimes, a lot of times, make that mistake, putting the, all the devas uh, on the same level. Brahma, Shiva, Vishnu, Ganesh, Surya, like that. So, Ishwar Parma Krishna, Sachit Ananda, Vigraha, Anadir Adir, Govinda, Sarvakarna. Krishna is the Supreme Ishwar. All the Devas and all the Yangas of the uh, Supreme Personality of Godhead are subordinate to Him. The other explanation is that the all auspicious embodiment of the Shaktis of Krishna are absolutely non-different from the fountainhead of Sarup of Krishna. Therefore, to see Hari Nam, and indeed the innumerable forms, qualities, and pastimes of Krishna as distinct from Krishna is an offense. In other words, the Krishna's name, Krishna's form, Krishna's qualities, Krishna's activities, they're all absolute principles of his transcendental Sarup. Sarup means his transcendental form. To make, to think, to make a distinction between these activities and his transcendental form is also the second offense like that. The jnanis, they do that. Okay, that's a little technical, yes. should not think that uh, the demigods were competing with uh, Vishnu or Krishna. Um, at the same time, we have a lot of stories like Brahma Vimohana Leela or Govardhan Leela where demigods are competing with him. So are we, how are we going? Yeah, but they lost each so, time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shiva did also. Shiva fought with, with, with Krishna. And Brahma, he also stole the calves that you mentioned in Cowherd Boys. There's other incidents too. In Ram Leela, no, not Ram Leela, Shiva didn't fight with Ram. So, yeah, there are incidents, but there was some incident that inspired the demigods to take action. In Brahma's case, he wasn't aware it was Krishna, he was thinking it was another powerful demigod. In Shiva's case, he knew he was the Supreme Lord, but he did it in order to protect his devotee, Banasura. But then after, Krishna said, why are you fighting with me? <laughs> Shiva said, I don't know. <laughs> he came to his senses. Shiva gets bewildered sometimes. <laughs> He's got a lot going. <laughs> so in that particular pastime, if you read that pastime, You'll find that uh, it, it, at that pastime kind of illustrates the power of Shiva and the power of Krishna and who has superior power. For those who have some doubt and play, place Shiva on the same level as Krishna, these pastimes are illustrative, showing what is the relationship between Shiva and, and Vishnu or Krishna. That. But in, that, in any case, we should understand that um, she, uh, Krishna is the Adi Purush. He is the one without a second. 
Nitya Nitya Nam Nitya 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 Nam Chaitanas Chaitana Nam Eko Baho Nam Vidadati Kaman. No one's greater to no one's So you find that a lot in people who are somewhat versed in the Vedic culture. Not having complete under not having the proper spiritual teachers to show the distinction. They may worship the various demigods along with Lord, Lord Vishnu. We have the Panchopashanam, which are done by the Mayavadis. Panchopashanam is they worship five deities. And who are the five deities? Vishnu, Shiva, Ganesh, Surya, and Durga. And they think they're all the same. And Vishnu is one of the in, the, in there. But Vishnu is an, is is on the level of the uh, on the level of the Godhead. The demigods are not. They're simply angas. That's all. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, the devas, those who worship the devas are less intelligent because they should understand that devas get their power from me. <laughs> so I don't think we worry about that too much in Western society, but in India, it goes on all the time. Yes? I was just wondering, sometimes devotees, uh, sometimes uh, devotees also used to uh, worship demigods for a material type of benediction. Uh, they offer uh, Mahaprasadam from the Lord, so in a way it's not independently uh, worshipping them, but... Uh, you can take the Lord's Mahaprasadam and offer to the demigods, you can do that. That's not worship. You're just giving them the Lord's mercy. When, when they do it for some kind of material type of uh, benediction? Then that's an offense. Mm. That's, using, uh, that's using the Lord to, for, for, to further one's material desires. That's like using the holy name in order to get something beneficial for... I chant because, you know, I want, you know, to be, I want to destroy my enemies. I want to become powerful. Or I chant for some kind of material gain to get more money, to get more intelligence in my business. That's offensive. <laughs> yes? I was wondering about our tilak. Who? Our tilak. Tilak. Radha and Krishna, and then we have Laksh Lakshmi in the middle. Yeah. Why is that? Let's stick to the questions of the. <laughs> we don't want to get too far away from the okay. this topic matter. I'll answer your question later. Okay. Yeah, let's Thank stick you. with the this particular because we have a lot to cover. But isn't Lakshmi a Devi? No. Lakshmi is. Uh, she's Shakti. Okay. She's Shakti. She's not. She's not Shakti, Mum. She's Shakti. She comes in the female energies, which are all in the, in the Shakti, the energies of the Lord. Mm -hmm. um, third offense. Uh, yes, Tushar, third offense. Okay, third offense. The teacher who delineates the highest and most esoteric tattva of the Harinam is the true Nam Guru, the spiritual master who initiates the disciple in chanting of the holy name. To develop unflinching faith in the Guru is obligatory for the disciple. A person who, because of misrepresentation of tattva, believes that the Nam Guru is only conversant with Shastras dealing with Harinam and is therefore not well-versed in the wider Vedanta philosophy commits a serious offense against the Holy. The Guru, the guru realizing the tattva of the Harinam is truly the best of all spiritual processors and must never be minimized. Minimized means to think he's an ordinary person. Just like Arche Vishnu Siladi, Guru Shu Namachi. To think that the Guru comes from a particular background, a particular caste, clan, Prabhupada, before he was a devotee, not before he was a devotee, he was always a devotee, before he was in the position of a spiritual master, he had a family, he had five children, he was a 
very successful businessman to look at these things and describe that as Prabhupada's, what we say, nature or something about his character is offensive. Because Krishna Shakti Vihana and Hadhad Vavartanam, that one, one who takes up the position of the role of a spiritual master is first empowered by the Lord to do the work. So that empowerment is, puts them on the transcendental platform or puts them on the position where they can act in, as a representative of the Lord. So you can't see that empowerment. You can experience it. But, but that empowerment makes that person not ordinary. So that's the understanding. The guru is not ordinary. Why? Because he's empowered by Krishna to do the service. <laughs> and to disobey, minimize, or to see him as one of the... Uh, one of the, one of the, categorize him within something material is the third offense like that especially disobedience so one may not be able to follow a particular instruction but one should voice their concern in order to get a clarification on the instruction or to get a different instruction <laughs> but to dispense with or disregard the instructions of the spiritual master is called the greatest offense to the Holy Name. <laughs> Why? Because the spiritual master is representing Krishna in the form of the Holy Name. So the offense against the spiritual master is offense against the Holy Name. It's non-different. So, um, therefore, Prabhupada said, you must read my books so you know what is my instructions. You must hear regularly to know what the instructions are. And there's two kinds of instructions. There's those that are general for everyone and those that are specific for certain devotees. So if you have the specific instructions and if you've been blessed with giving specific instructions, consider it a blessing because by carrying it out you get, you get great spiritual advancement. And that's clear. But the general instructions sometimes we don't know. We don't know. Like I see, a lot of devotees don't know proper cleanliness habits. You know, the cleanliness standard in our movement is very low. Um, Prabhupada would, he would, if he saw a devotee, you know, touch the floor and then try to touch something sacred after that, and he, he would get angry. Wash your hands. Put your hands to your mouth like that. He would say, "Go wash your hands." This is very unclean. You touch the floor, you touch your japa beads, you touch the floor, you touch the Bhagavatam, you touch your glass of water, then you touch the Bhagavatam. So all these things, they're against the principles of cleanliness. And cleanliness is a principle of Brahminical culture. It's one of the highest Brahminical culture principles. So unless we hear from Prabhupada, and or his representative who are speaking this, we don't know. We make these offenses. But you get a reaction for that. You get a reaction. Knowing or not knowing doesn't exempt one from getting a reaction from doing the wrong thing. So therefore when one has to hear regularly in order to avoid not transgressing the instructions of the spiritual master. <laughs> and that's why we ask questions too for clarification, for understanding, like that. It's important. Oh, I didn't know. Well, why didn't you know? <laughs> it's not an excuse. You can be forgiven, no question about that, but there's some reaction. Like killing bugs. When someone asked Prabhupada, should we kill the insect? Prabhupada said, you should be killed. <laughs> he said that. So sometimes devotees kill bugs. <laughs> but those bugs are living entities who are non-different than you. They just have a different body, that's all. <laughs> like that. So, like that. So we have to also avoid doing the wrong thing. <laughs> like that. If something is done accidentally... 
like Prabhupada says, if you're walking down the street, you're automatically killing living entities just by your walking, by your breathing, by smashing spices. So, you don't, you're doing that. Do you get a reaction for that if you're engaged in devotional service? No. Because you're engaged in devotional service, these things happen automatically, there is no reaction. But if you're not engaged in devotional service, you can imagine with the non-devotees how much they're building their karma every day. Just by breathing, they're, <laughs> they're, they're committing sinful activities. That's how polluted this material world is. <laughs> it's so polluted. Therefore, one should know what to avoid. <laughs> but if you're engaged in devotional service, then there's no reaction, even if you kill and make some mistake accidentally. There's no reaction. So these are just an example of how not being aware of the instructions of the spiritual master cause us to, to make that, these mistakes. We have to be aware. It's important to hear regularly. Anything else? Yeah. I'm reading from Jaiva Dharma right now. But, okay. To develop unflinching faith in the Guru is the... Uh, I, I couldn't get the rest of it. To develop unflinching faith in the Guru is the duty of the disciple? Let's see, where is Mini Right, reading? the very first sentence you read, third offense. To develop unflinching faith in the Nam Guru is obligatory for the disciple. It's an obligation. Otherwise, why would you take a spiritual master if you don't have faith? <laughs> is that's, that's, that's tested beforehand. You sit in front of the fire and you, you should be ready to accept the spiritual master. If you're not, don't sit there. <laughs> you're not ready. <laughs> that faith has to be there. And that, that faith is built by a testing period where you get to know the spiritual master. It's not that, oh, I just saw I'm so eager to get initiated, I don't care what happens, <laughs> as long as I get my name. <laughs> now that's the wrong attitude. It's all about having faith in Krishna Who's ha who has empowered a certain person to act on his behalf. That's all. Which page number is this on, Guru Maharaj? Uh, I don't have that available. Okay. These are just copies from the actual okay. text. Thank you. <laughs> okay, anything else on disobedience, third offense? Okay. Fourth offense. Okay. Someone? Anyone? Fourth offense? Hmm? And? And literature in pursuance of the Vedic version. Both. Okay. Okay, let me see. This is a long explanation. Oh, whatever profound spiritual truth is discussed in the Shastras, that truth concerning Harinam is always placed on the highest pedestal. Sri Vishnu, your sacred name is absolutely cognizant and all illumining because the entire Vedic scriptures have emanated from you. Your name is the wellspring of spiritual bliss, the embodiment of Brahman, and is ready, available, and is full of transcendental knowledge. We meditate upon the purport of your name, discuss name amongst ourselves, and chant your name continuously. In this way, we worship you. That's from that's from Hari Bhakti Vilas. That's a quotation. So there's some people who study the Vedas and know the various Shruti statements in the Vedas and say that the statements regarding the Harley name are not the highest statements. But they're just incidental, they're necessary. Therefore, based on their Vedic conclusion of studying the Shrutis, not the Smritis, the Shrutis are the actual Vedas, which include the Upanishads. 
they conclude that the glories of the Holy Name are not really the highest aspect of the execution of, of spiritual life. They give more importance to other aspects and other scriptures that glorify karma and jnana, like that. So that is an offense for them. But what they're doing is that these other scriptures that do glorify the holy name, they're minimizing these scriptures. So to minimize that, that's offense. That's the fourth offense. Is that clear? In other words, in the Kali Sattara Upanishads, it says, Iti Soda Sakam Nam Nam Kali Kamas and Nasanam. Nata Parateo Payo Sarva Veda Juvishate Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare. That verse concludes the holy name. In that in the Santara Upanishads, any Upanishads is the Shrutis, it's the Vedas. The Smritis are the, the Puranas, the Itihastras, the Bhagavad Gita Smriti, the Mahabharata, Ram Ramayana. These are all commentaries on the, on the, on the Vedas. And they must be accepted because they apply to time, place, and circumstance. Now, people who study the Shrutis, they say, oh, okay. Uh, chanting of the holy names, these scriptures that mention chanting of the holy names are not really as important as the, you know, the Vedas, the Yajurveda, which talks about various types of pujas, homas, and practices that really bring people to transcendental knowledge and detachment, but not to bhakti. Therefore, Krishna said to Arjun, Triguna Visaya Veda, Nistriguna Bhavarjuna, Nirdandro Nitisadva, so near Yogam Shema Advaba. The Vedas deal with the three modes of material nature. Rise above these three modes, be transcendental to them, be free from all anxieties and all, all fear and all anxieties, and must be established in the self. Krishna instructs Arjuna. But the Vedas are still talking about the three modes like that. That's why we need the Shrutis in order to give commentary on the Shrutis that apply to... The, and therefore, the highest is the Puranas because they deal with practical understanding of Bhakti. And the highest of all Purana is Amalam Purana, which is Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the highest of all. So, not knowing the relationship between the different sh scriptures, they minimize or blaspheme or criticize other scriptures that glorify the holy name. Like that. Now, another explanation, which is we hear in our day-to-day -day life in Krishna consciousness, is that outside of the not outside, but known as scriptures of the other religions, such as the Bible, Quran, the Torah, and various other scriptures of other religions. They don't always teach pure devotional service. They teach mixed devotional service and have some elements of pure devotional service in there. To criticize, to minimize, to find fault with these scriptures is another form of offense. Because they're made or designed and empowered by the Lord for a certain class of people who cannot or are unable to or haven't had the access to pure scripture. So they can practice spiritual life in a, what is called karma gyan, karma, karma mishra bhakti, jnana mishra bhakti, uh, yoga mishra bhakti. And you find that's the, but to, to criticize these other scriptures disturbs the mind and its offense. You should know the difference, that's all, and see the difference, but don't find fault, because they are for a certain class of people. See the. Okay, for those who are preachers, this is important to understand, or for everyone also. Any questions about the fourth one? Yes. 
Roberto. So if we are in discussion uh, from different uh, different scripts, do we then uh, it's like so we don't try to find faults in others, but try to say how this is more superior or no? Oh, if you use the word superior, you're already finding fault. <laughs> you just uh, emphasize what is what is bhakti. That's all. You explain the, that bhakti is the complete aspect of the living entity's relationship with God. To work for God is nice. To develop knowledge of God is nice. But to love God is the highest. Love God, loving God includes, includes serving God and working for God and also knowledge of God. But these other scriptures have elements of bhakti in it, but they don't emphasize bhakti as the goal. That's all. Okay? Don't find fault. <laughs> disturbed. Prabhupada says it causes the mind to become disturbed. <laughs> Fifth offense. Anyone? Go over down Leela. Okay, to consider the glories of chanting Hare. Persons who disrespect the Shrutis, Smritis, and Puranas are wonderful and wonderfully glorify Harinam with this speculative assertion that the glorification of Harinam within such scriptures are mere exaggeration, are hurled down to the hellish planet known as Aksaya, the inexhaustible hell. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> so, in other words, the yeah, we know the holy name is great, but the scriptures are using eulogies, they're using hyperboles, exaggerations, just so you will chant. And so it's not really like that. In other words, when the when it says that there's no other way, no other way, no other way, Harir Nama, Harir Nama, Harir Nama, Eva Ke Valom Kalona, Stevana, Stevana, Steva Gatian. When they hear things like that, they say, that's one way, but not the only way. But that's from that's spoken by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He quotes the Brihad Narodiya Purana. There's no other way. <laughs> the, the, the holy name is the highest form of the of worship and the glories of the holy name are nam nam akardi bahuda nija sarva shaktis what does that mean all the qualities all the names all the forms all the pastimes all the attributes all everything about the absolute truth is contained in the name Krishna it's perfect and complete Krishna's name and Krishna, if Krishna were to personally appear here in his transcendental form, of course we would, we wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> Some of us would say, uh, "Boy, who's this guy dressed so nicely?" <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, if Krishna were to personally appear in his transcendental form as Krishna, and then we would chant his name and we would think there's a difference that is that is a dis wrong mentality there's no difference on an absolute level between Krishna and his name abhinatvam nami nami no there's no difference but how to realize that you can't use intellectual capacities to understand the nature of the holy name it's not possible all you can do is chant Purify your heart and, and experience the, 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 some of the glories of the Holy Name. But there's enough glories in the Holy Name to take you to the highest stage of transcendental ecstasy. And, that's, and even that is just part of the glories of the Holy Name. It's not possible. It's just inconceivable. Totally inconceivable. Yes. Uh, so supposing, um, 
supposing people say i want to chant the names of god yes i understand but i will chant my name i have this particular name and so i prefer to say so and so whatever concoction they come up with so how how can we know which are the legitimate names of god to chant it's, because jesus it's mentioned prabhupad makes the same point he said the authorized names that are in the scriptures and you can't create your own name and expect to get the benefits and it's like you create your own law and follow that and you get arrested <laughs> You can't create your own name or something you like. <laughs> it has to be from the scriptures. Shruti Smriti Pranadi Pancharachaki Vidhi Vidam. We have to follow Shastra. If you don't follow Shastra, you're considered Naistiki. Naistiki means atheist. Gnostic, not Naistiki, I'm sorry, Gnostic, atheist. So that it, means all the names like Allah, Buddha, they're in Yahweh, all those are legitimate names. Of they're God. in the scriptures, yes. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Okay, sixth offense. Someone. Someone read. Hmm? To give interpretation. This, the sixth offense is to consider Nam as imaginary and fictitious proposition. It's almost similar to the fifth, but there's a difference. The Mayavadi speculators and gross materials conclude that Brahman, the supreme app, is impersonal, formless, and nameless. They speculate that the names such as Rama, Krishna, and, all, and so on are fabricated by the sages and given to the Brahman only to accomplish a specific purpose. When, with such purpose has been achieved, the names are no longer necessary. This is the opinion of Harinam given by these demonic offenders. So the point is that they say that, okay, in order for worship, you need form, you need names. So we chant the names of the Lord, and then when we reach the unmanifested Brahman, there's no need to chant anymore because you have achieved. So it's like if you want to climb up on a roof, you need a ladder. But then when you get to the roof, the ladder is no longer necessary. So same way, chant the holy names until you achieve your goal and then there's no need. Because the, the name is simply a means to the end. It's not the end in itself. Like that. So that's their... They do that with the deity too. The impersonalists, they worship the deity, but they say beyond the deity is the unmanifested form of the deity, which is the Brahman effulgence. So forms are necessary, names are necessary for the sake of worship. In order to worship, you have to have objects or names. So they say that these objects and names have been created for the sake of worship, but beyond that is the truth. <laughs> So that's the sixth offense to the holy name, like them. If we don't receive proper instructions and understand that that these names and the names of the Lord are transcendental and always what we say, free from anything material. Seventh offense. Okay, this this is considered the most dangerous offense. I'm taking a little time. Is that okay? We go a little bit over time today. Is is that all right? Or do you want me to stop? Okay. It actually makes breakfast even better. <laughs> Wait a little longer. But that's not the idea. <laughs> okay. Seventh offense. Mm-hmm. Okay. So to commit sinful activities and then chant. The mentality is now I have the tool for getting rid of my sinful activities. Therefore, I'll go ahead and do these things. I have a little illicit sex. I'm intoxication. 
some this something sinful or something against Vedic injunction, and then I'll chant, and then I'll be free from the reactions. Uh, this is a very dangerous mentality, and the Holy Name will not relieve you of the reaction, because the Holy Name is Krishna. If you consciously commit the offense and thinking that way, the Holy Name will withdraw its mercy. But if you accidentally or due to previous habits, fall and do something wrong, and you realize, oh, I made a mistake, I committed a sinful activity. That's not offensive. That, that doesn't apply in this case. Prabhupada said you might have associated with some of your old friends, and they have some bad habits, and because you're in that association, you might do something wrong. And then you realize, oh, why did I do that? And that's accidental. It's incid incidental, you may say. It's due to situation. Of course, the idea is to avoid that so it doesn't happen. But if it does, it's not the seventh offense. The seventh offense is when you consciously make a plan to get rid of your reactions and then commit some sinful activity. Example was in our movement many years ago, 1974, one very charismatic, charismatic spiritual master who had a following joined our movement. He was a Westerner, he was an American, and he brought about a hundred of his followers. They all became devotees. And he was quite popular even within the movement, and he was very dedicated to Prabhupada. But being very innovative in his own preaching, he decided to add some innovation into ISKCON. So he started to say that it's okay to take intoxication and chant, such as marijuana. It was just marijuana. So you smoke marijuana and then you chant Hare Krishna. So his followers, most of them, not all of them, were starting to do that. And he was having some influence. And then the word got back to Prabhupada. But when they questioned Prabhupada, they said, Prabhupada, he's still chanting Hare Krishna. He's very strict on his chanting. But he's doing... Prabhupada said his chanting is offensive. It has no meaning at all. Because he's breaking, he's, following, he's committing sinful activities on the strength and of the holy name, like that. So this is an example of how the seventh offense is transgressed like that. So is that clear? I think that's a pretty simple one to understand. Any questions on that? Yes, Roberto. Is there any uh, a subtle ways of doing the seventh offense? No, I don't think so. It's all based on the gross, the actual activity itself. A lot of times we also break the seven, we, we think of sinful activities in our mind. The mind gets wrong thoughts. But then we catch ourselves, as I mentioned early, we have to kill these thoughts. But if it, if it, if it appears in your mind, no, it's not. It's not enough. Okay? Sri Devi? No, he, he left the movement. And he's still popular. He preaches around the world now. He's a great preacher. <laughs> I won't mention his name. Some of his devotees left with him. Some stayed and became, you know, they're still here and probably they're disciples of Prabhupada. So, he's a good preacher. But how much more... Uh, bad reactions are happening because he's preaching, but at the same time he's committing sinful activities. So I don't know if he's still doing that or not. Oh, I don't. Want, I don't know his present day situation. He recently gave five thousand dollar donation to our temple in Hawaii. He's very favorable to ISKCON. Devotees like him. 
no bad feelings, but when he was there, he created this wrong thing, and then, of course, he left. If I were to meet him, I'd offer my obeisances to him. <laughs> great soul. He's very great soul. And he chants Hare Krishna. <laughs> Thank okay. You. Okay, so eighth offense. Hmm. No, that's that's not that's the ninth. Eighth offense? Yes. To consider the chanting of the holy name to, as one of their auspicious ritualistic activities which are found in the Vedas, Karmakanda. To understand the eighth Namparad, one must discriminate between pious activities and devotional service. Again, this is, goes on in the Vedic culture, not so much in Western society, because we're not so much attuned to that. Sat karma comprises namitika dharma or vanashram, giving in charity, observing religious vows, performing philanthropic work, renouncing everything, including the fruits of one's labor, conducting religious sacrifices, practicing astanga yoga. In addition, other materially pious deeds as prescribed in the shastras are within the purview of dharma, known as jada dharma. They are not spiritual. In contrast to chanting Sri Krishna Nam, it is supramundane, super purely spiritual activities. Satkarma activities are only upaya, a means to an end. In other words, these other things that, that people perform are supportive of moral and religious principles. They can elevate one to higher planets, but they're not pure bhakti. We sometimes we find people engaged in that in Krishna conscious activities, but we don't say don't do that. We say, but they are not equal to chanting the Hari name. When, the tendency is that some of these people, um, due to wrong can understanding, put everything on the same level. You, I do my puja. You do your japa. It's all the same. It's not. The holy name is transcendental to all of that. <laughs> to think like that is offense. Or to act like that is an offense. So, now therefore, concluded state. Therefore, chanting Harinam must not be compared to any material pious activities, religious or otherwise. <laughs> okay, number nine. Any questions on number eight? <laughs> Didn't those of you who have been brought up in that culture, did you get over that yet? <laughs> no? <laughs> Not yet? Because you keep meeting it again and again and again. Yeah. Convince your family is really hard. <laughs> yeah. Because they think they're doing the right thing. Um, sorry. Yeah. You keep you just keep meeting it again and again and again, especially where your family are concerned. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's hard to then not to be offensive to them. Mm -hmm. But also to try and keep yourself free from that. Free from it. Yeah. Because sometimes you think, you, you get doubts, obviously you do. But then you say, no, but this is what I, what I know is better f for everyone, for me. Right. Um, it, is, it, is, it is... It's a challenge, yeah, especially with family it members. It is a challenge, yeah. yeah. But also, you know, like, uh, we speak Gujarati, so we say, like, this weekend we did the Ramayana in Gujarati. Mm-hmm. But it has a different name. It's called Sundaka. It's called what? Sundaka. Sundaka. Yeah. And so we sat there chanting it in Gujarati. Um, but people make it ritualistic as well. 
So we were sitting there chanting in Gujarati, but the people make it ritualistic and they think they have to do certain things and what do you do? You have yeah. to let them. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, that's filtered into our society a lot. <laughs> but if we keep hearing and have the clear understanding, we don't have we don't push these persons who have al down, but we have to at the same time we simply emphasize what is the right principles, that's all. But their conditioning is so strong that unless they have an experience, they don't change generally. Yeah. So then we have we do have a lot of rituals. We do have a lot of pujas. Even in our movement, we have the fire sacrifice and we offer grains to the mouth of Lord Vishnu or Agni in the form of Agni. So uh, we are also doing a lot of pujas. Why we don't simply chant the Hare Krishna mantra? Why we perform all these things? Coming up. (laughs) (laughs) I can find it. I'm pretty much... Let's see. I know where it is. I have to just hunt it down here. Third chapter. Getting close. Okay. Let me see. Let's see. Since one may easily achieve the highest success by chanting the holy name of the Lord, one must ask why there are so many Vedic ritual ceremonies and why people are attracted to them. This is Prabhupada. Where's my glasses? I can't find them. Oh yeah, thank you. Absent-minded. Okay. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, Vedaishya Sarvam Aham Eva Vedo Vedanta Krit Veda Vit Veda. The real purpose of studying the Vedas is to approach the lotus feet of the Lord. Unfortunately, unintelligent persons bewildered by the grandeur of Vedic yagyas want to see gorgeous sacrifices performed. They want Vedic mantras chanted and huge amounts of money spent for such ceremonies. Sometimes we have to observe Vedic ritualistic ceremonies to please such unintelligent men. Recently, when we established a large Krishna Balaram temple in Vrindavan, we were obliged to have Vedic ceremonies enacted by Brahmins because the inhabitants of Vrindavan, especially the Sparta Brahmins, would not accept Europeans and Americans as bona fide Brahmanas. Thus, we had to engage Brahmanas to perform costly yagyas. In spite of these yagyas, the members of our society preferred Sankirtan loudly with Murdangas. And I consider the Sankirtan more important than the Vedic ritualistic ceremonies. Both the ceremonies and the Sankirtan was going on simultaneously. The ceremonies were meant for persons interested in Vedic rituals for elevation of the higher planets, whereas the Sankirtans were meant for pure devotees interested in pleasing the Supreme Personality of Godhead. We would simply have performed Sankirtan, but the inhabitants of Vrindavan would not have taken the installation ceremony seriously. As explained here, the Vedic performances are meant for those intelligence that has been dulled by the flowery language of the Vedas, which describe fruit of activities intended to elevate one to the higher planetus. Essentially, in this age of Kali, Sankirtan alone is sufficient. If the members of our temples in different parts of the world simply continue before the deity Sankirtan, especially before the deity of Mahaprabhu, they will remain perfect. There is no need of any other performances. Nevertheless, to keep oneself clean in habits in mind, deity worship and other regulative principles are required. Srila Jiva Goswami says that although Sankirtan is sufficient for the perfection of, archanam, of, of perfection of life, 
The archanam, or worship of the deity in the temple, must continue in order for the devotees to stay clean and pure. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur therefore recommends that one must follow both processes simultaneously. We strictly follow this principle of performing deity worship and sankirtan along parallel lines. This we should continue. It's the sixth canto, third chapter, verse 24, 25 in that area. That's the whole purport. So, yeah, to give authority to our movement. But ultimately, if we did sankirtan all the time, that would be, but we can't because we're not able to do it. So if we would need to, in order to stay pure, we do all of these, we have to do these other processes. And people have different likings. So ultimately, therefore we have to keep emphasizing that the glories of the Holy Name are the essential principle of success in spiritual life. Chanting, dancing, and glorifying the Lord. Okay, that's the eighth offense. Ninth offense. To hmm? inst yeah, go ahead. Okay. All of the instructions given in the entire Vedic scriptures, the directions to chant Harinam is foremost. Only those persons who have cultivated Shraddha in Sudha Bhakta are eligible candidates for hearing the unlimited glories of Harinam. Faithless persons are generally averse to spiritual activities and to hearing the glories of Harinam. Therefore, to instruct such irreligious, faithless persons about the esoteric details of Harinam is certainly offense. Certainly, it is necessary to explain to the general population that chanting Harinam is the most beneficial spiritual practice, and that those who practice will achieve complete benediction. Yet, the confidential knowledge of Harinam and the esoteric science of chanting should not be disclosed, should be disclosed only to the worthy and the faithful. Is that pretty clear? We talk, we, go, we preach the glories, we preach about the Holy Name, but we don't get into the esoteric aspects of chanting that uh, if you chant the Holy Names, you'll become a pure devotee. We say chant and be happy, chant and get rid of stress, chant, it's a nice song. <laughs> In other words, you have to take, you have to be very sensitive to people who may not be ready to hear these things. Because if they take exception, then they commit an offense, or they don't commit an offense, but they create a wrong mentality within themselves which may block them from future advancement. So you're hurting them in that sense, like that. Is that clear? Okay. And then he goes on to explain, when one becomes realized, uh, Uttama Adhikari, one can acquire the Shakti to empower others to take up devotional service. An Uttama Arikari can instill faith in Harinam in the conditioned souls and thus instruct them in the chanting of the Harinam by bestowing his Bhakti Shakti. However, as long as one remains a Madhyama Arikari, must, must avoid, carefully avoid companionship with the faithless, the gross materialist, the disinterested, and the atheist. <laughs> These are the injunctions. Okay. Everybody still alive? If you're if you're not alive, raise your hand. <laughs> Good. <laughs> then then a response. 
Gurudev, there are many persons who initiate unfit persons into Harinam for material gain and personal fame. How should we see them? They are Nama Paradis, offenders against the holy name. So one who initiates for name and fame to gather followers for prestige or from some pecuniary gains like that. I should initiate this person because he's rich. That's why if he's rich, I'll have a nice car also because he's my disciple. You know, so these, these, this type of mentality, you know, is offensive to the Holy Name. Okay, so the last one, Tenth Offense. To maintain material attachment and not have complete faith in the Holy Name, mm. even after having heard so many instructions on the glories of the Holy Name. Certain types of persons are greatly intoxicated by their false ego, imagining themselves to be monarchs of everything they survey, and thus they treat their imagined subordinates as their serfs with gross mentality of me and mine. On rare occasions they are gripped with the desire for renunciation, and a curiosity for the spiritual unknown. They approach the learned Sudabhaktas to hear about the glories of the Harinam, but they do not receive this knowledge with proper faith and devotion, and eventually turn back to their material attachments. They are Namaparadis, as mentioned in the second verse of Shishik Shastakam, like that. Your transcendental name has, can bestow all good fortune upon the living entities. So that one, I, me, and mine offense, is in a practical sense for us here in Krishna consciousness, if we continue to practice year after year, but still maintain material attachments, and still think that these material attachments will give you success in life, happiness, or you're just attached to them because you can't give it up. Um, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur calls that weakness of heart. I know I should give it up. I can't. Therefore, I can't. I don't want to. <laughs> like that. So, sufficiently hearing the glories of the Holy Name, sufficiently chanting the Holy Name, year after year after year, still maintaining that I'm this body, these extensions of my body, such as my family members, are also mine. Janasa moham yam maham mameti. Like that. So this I and my offense, like that, remained attached year after year after year. And that's the I, me, and mine offense. And that is, it's a very, that one can kick one outside of devotional service because of, after some time, by maintaining material attachments, one will go back to those material attachments and give up, have, may have a tendency to give up spiritual life just to fulfill those attachments. Yes. What can we do about this one? Because uh, these uh, manifest on the level of desires which uh, we cannot really We have to control. cultivate transcendental knowledge. As Krishna explains in the very beginning of Bhagavad Gita, he spends a good 20 verses explaining the difference between you and your body, between what is temporary, what is eternal. So at least we should theoretically know we may not realize we're not this body, but at least we should theoretically know we're not this body. And then helpfully, when we th through that theoretical understanding, we gain more knowledge, practice devotional service, and gradually we move away from our material bodily attachments. But the reason why we don't is because we don't have enough knowledge of the transcendence. 
We don't understand how powerful Krishna consciousness is and how powerful transcendental knowledge is. We don't cultivate it, we don't understand it. We hear it, it goes in one ear and out the other. I'm not this body. You're not this body. I know. But I'm a female not this body, and he's a male not this body. <laughs> One of our <laughs> preachers was preaching in <laughs> one country in South America, and he was saying, you're a soul. You're not this body. You're a soul. And she was a very aristocratic male and female person. And she said, oh, yes, I know I'm a soul. I'm a female soul. And my husband, he's a male soul. <laughs> Attaching gender onto the soul. <laughs> keeping that gender concept. But in this life, you're a female. Last life, what were you? You don't know. Could have been a male. Guys, maybe you were, you know, wearing dresses in your last life, you know. <laughs> now, even women don't wear dresses nowadays, anyway. But maybe you were looking into, mirror, into the mirror for a long period of time in your last life. <laughs> so... It's just a joke. <laughs> She's very serious. <laughs> she don't catch on me. <laughs> That's Sheev's mother. She's first time she came. Thank you for coming. Second time. You've been here before? When? Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Good. We're happy you came back. Give some... Just give a, give a little purity to our existence. <laughs> She's, she dresses her deities every day with the most beautiful, beautiful decorations. Yeah, so we don't know this gender thing. If you get attached to, if you get overly attached to your wife, and then, honey <laughs> bow. You'll be Mrs. in the next life. <laughs> Sorry, for mothers there's a serious attachment for their children. Even when the children have grown up, I'm guilty. Okay? <laughs> so, um, uh, and to let go, and well... It's normally a mother is always saying, oh, when they're settled, or when they're this, or when they're that. So we always have a... But your attachment is great, because you made all three of them devotees. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <I know. laughs> all three kids are devotees. <laughs> um, how do you actually school yourself, I suppose? I suppose <clears throat> it's easy to see. You have to see two things. You're a mother, but you're also... <clears throat> Your relationship is that this, this soul that came into your life as your children, as your husband, belongs to Krishna. That soul doesn't belong to you. You've been in, in charge to take care of that soul as a mother. And you do it with love, with care, and with spiritual guidance. And you develop a relationship based on that. But you should know that that relationship is based on Krishna giving you that particular soul in your life to guide and to take care of that soul. That soul belongs to Krishna, not to you. <laughs> that doesn't mean you don't have love or care, but still, that soul is not the body. It's more than your son or daughter. It's Krishna part and parcel. So you have to see both things side by side. So when you raise your children, you have to give them both motherly love, guidance, and spiritual direction. If you give one or the other, it's, it's incomplete. <laughs> Thank you, man. Mothers in this day age are not appreciated enough. Motherhood is, according to Shastra, is one of the most elevated principles. When 
when the yaksha was questioning, this is in the Mahabharata, was questioning Yamaraj, not Yamaraj, but Yudhisthira. The yaksha was his father, Yamaraj, in the form of a yaksha. He was questioning Yudhisthira. He asked him 50 questions. One of the questions is, says, what is heavier than the earth? And the answer is, mother. <laughs> yeah. A mother is the foundation of all material direction, success, and love. Father is second. He's incidental. He's needed. <laughs> mother and father. But of the two, mother is higher. And that's Shastra, not Shastra. So that's why we say there are seven mothers. And mother means someone who is actually worshipable. So we actually worship our mother. Or we worship all women who, uh, who have that position. Because they are, uh, what we say, they, are, they, have, they give a special feature to life, which is caring and nurturing. Like that. So a mother is a very glorious position. It's not to be minimized. In this age, it seems to be quite, quite ordinary to be a mother. It's just a routine thing. And, and so, yeah, it mentions that the highest person in existence is Krishna. And the second is mother, the third is father. <laughs> That's why everyone remembers Mother's Day. But what day of the year? When, when is Father's Day? We, we always forget, right? <laughs> we need both. <laughs> There's no question about that. Everyone has to have a father and mother. And they both play different roles in the relationship to the children. But mother is the more more direct role. She's the one that, that implants on the child the most. If she's doing her duty as a mother. Okay, I think we got off on a little sidetrack. But any questions, comments to conclude? Yes. Thank you. Um, I appreciate Indian culture because um, I saw like also Prabhupada um, when he was with his mother, he always actually he said to his disciple to pay obeisances first to, to mother when he was initiated. Yeah, Brahmananda. Yeah, well Indian culture has elements of Vedic culture in it, but it also doesn't. <laughs> So to use it exclusively is not correct, because some things in Indian culture are not spiritual. But general principles of morality, civility, etiquette, and uh, uh, principles of how to live life properly are there within the Vedic culture and, and in the Indian culture. The Indian culture is being challenged by Western materialistic culture. And because it's seen as inferior, people from who have been grown up in the Indian culture are accepting Western culture and thinking it's something superior <laughs> or better. Like that. But it's actually a spiritual culture. <laughs> yeah. Even the language. Sanskrit and Hindi is very similar, right? Very similar. Okay, I think I went over a little bit. But we have uh, most of the morning up until now, until it's just bhajans, right? I think that's the schedule. So after breakfast, bhajans all the way up until lunch. And then the devotees who are scheduled to meet with me I think they have to see Vishnu Priya, and she can arrange your schedule. And that'll go on from 
say quarter to 11 all the way up into 1.30. So. Okay, um, do we have some volunteers to organize the bhajans? We're going to need somebody to... You arrange that? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Sri Harinam Sankirtan Ki Jai, Sri Panchatattva Ki Jai. Thank you.